on that that are, are probably pretty obvious, but let me just go through them in, in, um, in some interesting stories and some experiences that we've come across at the state level. Um, one thing is that there's competition now for our housing that isn't just local markets anymore. I think we all are beginning to recognize that not only do we have home buyers coming in from outside of the state, in fact, I believe that in 2006, about 30% of the homes that were built by the members of the building association industry in Montana were for out-of-state folks moving in. Um, and, I th and, and our building costs, the materials, supplies, et cetera, are also becoming more and more globalized in terms of what affects those costs of building materials. I know, Colin, you did some data on the cost of building materials, and you're going to get into that? Okay, so they're going up faster than incomes are, too, as it turns out. So that's some of the stuff that underlies why these things are diverging. Um, one of the other major challenges that Montana faces is the whole question of infrastructure, particularly water and sewer. Uh, a lot of the towns in Montana built their systems between 1900 and 1920, their core systems, their core distribution systems. One thing that's happened since then, of course, is that the Environmental Protection Agency has come along and said, okay, if you all are going to be providing water to drink and you're going to have to be treating your sewage before it goes back into whatever water course it's going back into, we're going to keep making sure that we keep those standards up to where they should be. So the treatment facilities have had to comply with more and more strict standards as time has gone on and they keep getting more and more strict as we get more people, more challenges to that going on. So that just keeping a system up to snuff right now is an expensive proposition for cities and towns and public water systems. What the hidden thing is that, that's sort of looming under the ground there and waiting to come out and spring on us is that the basic distribution systems in many, many communities are about at the end of their lifespan. An example is Cut Bank. Its system was put in in 1914. They estimate that it's going to cost about $20 million to replace the core dis distribution system in Cut Bank for water and another 20 for sewer. They're looking at $40 million worth of investment just to be able to keep the system they have right now going. And there's a lot of communities around the state that are in the same boat. So of course, when we talk about affordable housing, one of the big items these days in getting a piece of land to put a house on is what are the infrastructure costs going to be? Well, it is a challenge to figure out how to pay those if we charge them to the unit of housing that's being built on that particular piece of land. There's a limit to how cheap that house can be because that infrastructure costs money. You have to pay for it from somewhere. Years ago, we had a lot more public resources. We paid for them and subsidized them, if you will, for the homeowners years ago. These days, I don't know how we're going to do that. I think we need to re-examine that question of where do we get the money to pay for infrastructure. Right now, most of the infrastructure funding programs available at the state level are there and end up getting used for emergency situations, like the cut bank situation, where their system's going to fail if they don't do something about it now. To be able to have more than that available, to be able to think ahead and actually build some infrastructure out before the housing gets there and think it through and, and have it be subsidized somehow that way, those resources just don't seem to be there right now at the state level. So. So that's another major question we need to be looking at in terms of what's going on with those housing costs. I think when we, when we were looking at the situation that the state, we said, well, what are the steps we can take? And, and one of them, of course, is that we certainly can preserve the housing we have. That's a good step to try to make sure we don't lose any of the housing that's out there right now. I think there's two big items there that I'd like to mention that, that are in danger of being lost right now. One of them are subsidized units that we already have in place. I think at the, uh, at the meeting we had in December, we came up with an estimate that there are about 21,000 units of subsidized housing in the state of Montana. That's housing for those folks for whom 30% of their income falls short of what rent would be. And so they're either getting vouchers where they get some supplement to help pay that extra cost, or they're in a facility that itself is subsidized so that they only have to pay 30% of their income. Unfortunately, 4,650 of those units are now on year-to-year -year contracts. 
And those units, the owners of those units, have now the flexibility to be able to say at any time, oh, you know, I think maybe I'll make these into condos. Or I'll turn them into market rate units, rental units, instead of subsidized rental units. Or I'll tear it down and do something else with that piece of property. There are now options out there which put the ongoing existence of 4,650 of those units in jeopardy. So that's a big chunk. That's about a quarter of the units that are out there could be gone with a couple of different decisions made by those owners over the next couple of years. Another major supplier of affordable housing is manufactured mobile homes units. We have about 50,000, 50 to 60,000 of those units that are occupied right now in the state. And if you stop and think about what those typically cost, lot rents and whatnot, to, to rent one of those, they're among the least expensive housing that we have. 50,000 of those units, 21,000 subsidized units, together they compose a huge amount of housing units that serve our lowest population income lowest income population people. Those mobile home units have a lot of serious challenges going forward. One of them is that about 25 to 28,000 of those units were built before 1976. Now, those of you who are in the housing business all know the magical date, 1976. In fact, I actually found it was June something of 1976, is the date upon which, from there forward, all mobile homes had to meet at least basic health and safety standards regulated by the federal government. Prior to that time, they did not. So we have a stock of about 25,000, 28,000 mobile homes out there that are substandard because they weren't built to the right standards to begin with. They need to be taken out of commission, they need to be replaced. And that's a huge question of how we're going to do that. Another major threat, which I know you've had a little problems with here in Missoula, is where, do you, where can those mobile homes sit? Well, the obvious place for years and years and years where we've had them is mobile home parks. Now, the land under those mobile home parks is more valuable for other purposes than for housing mobile homes. And close into town, where the transportation costs are affordable, there isn't land available again, because of the high cost of land, that pencils out to build more mobile home car parks. So when we lose those mobile home courts, we're losing very affordable housing units that will not be replaced easily. One of the interesting solutions that's been proposed that I'm not sure will work in Missoula, but could work elsewhere in the state, is moving toward what is now called ROCs. That's R-O-C, resident-owned communities. And this is where the folks who live in the mobile home court actually pool their resources, come together, form a nonprofit corporation, and actually purchase the mobile home from the owners. In places where land values haven't escalated too far, the ongoing stream of income from lot rents, which has been there for a long time, those tenants are the ones who've been supplying that long-term stream of income. And it's a steady stream of income, and it's sufficient to be able to get a loan to be able to have them purchase that park and operate it themselves. Not surprisingly, in many, many cases, when the residents take over a mobile home court, the infrastructure quality goes up, the maintenance goes up, because they're interested in living there and having a nice place to live. They're not interested in just taking cash out and just uh, using it as, an, as a source of revenue and investment. So there's been about 85 of these created over the years in New Hampshire. Not one of them has ever failed to meet its obligations financially. So that's a, a very promising potential that we could look at here in Montana. And again, it's, it's questionable about Missoula because, again, your land values have gotten too high too fast. I know it would never work in Whitefish, where we've had some articles hitting the news the last couple of years of major sized parks going down. But it, it, it is something to think about going forward. Housing rehabilitation is an interesting question. We actually were able to get some data out of the Department of Revenue data. And not surprisingly, the largest number of units in Montana that are abandoned that need significant rehab are in eastern Montana, where they've been losing population for some time. They are not now. They're facing housing shortages out there. But the stock of housing that's the older stock that they have, in many cases, is probably not cost effective to rehab. That's a big question of what we're going to do going forward. How much of the existing housing stock can we still save? 
and how much of it are we going to just have to get rid of and, and replace? In many places in eastern Montana, they don't have a construction industry sufficient to be able to do stick-built housing in a lot of places. I think in a lot of eastern Montana areas, they're perhaps their best and only option for new housing is to get some form of modular or manufactured housing to be able to bring it in and assemble it on site, as opposed to having to have the whole crew there and bring in all the supplies with the transportation costs, et cetera. Um, we, I think, are looking at a very different picture going forward for what the options for housing are than what we've had in terms of patterns from the past. So I think the, the bottom line here, and, and I think at this point maybe what I'll do is I'll, I'll ask for some assistance in handing out these two, two data sheets that I have. One is for Missoula County and the other one is for the state of Montana. And they look identical except for the fact that one has a little state map in the corner with a little dark spot where Missoula County is and the other one has no map. The one with no map is Montana. Okay, I better take one of each before I go. Thank you. While these are, are being passed around, um, I just want to just uh, share a couple of other interesting little tidbits that have drifted across my attention span lately about the face of the future. I was listening to KUFM about a week ago, and they had a, a news story on about the state of California under Governor Jerry Brown many years ago, 20 years ago, put in some pretty strict green building standards for what could be added in terms of housing stock in California. And of course, green building is housing that is energy efficient, that is well insulated, et cetera, that has low operating costs. It turns out that 20 years later, that investment is paying off. California now has the lowest energy consumption per capita of any state in the country. So that whole idea of paying attention at the public policy level to housing standards is an important one going forward. Um, so, if everybody's had a chance to take a look at these, let's take a look at this. I'm sure you're all interested mostly in Missoula, so let's look at Missoula first. Let me just tell you where these calculations came from. And I should start off right off the bat, if, if, if I'm sure one of you is going to notice real soon, if you haven't already, that um, the, we, we made one mistake in labeling the chart. So if you'll all look at the first set of affordability boxes, the blue, orange, and green ones on the left-hand side for the year 2000. The amount for the uh, blue box and the orange box have been switched. They should be the other way around. Back in 2000, as you can see from the fact that the blue box is a little higher than the orange box, already in Missoula County, the median priced house was not affordable to the median household income. And the median priced house was 124, 666, and the income, I mean, in the house that was affordable to the income was 115. So, uh, you know, you do everything you can to proof all this stuff, and something still slips through, you know, no matter what you do. Anyhow, so, so our first, this big area up on top with these bars is just again to give people a sense of what's happening with incomes, the purchasing power of those incomes and what's happening to housing costs going out to 2006 and then 2020. And of course, it's no surprise to you folks here that, that Missoula's had problems in, in having a f home prices be affordable for some time. The middle section of this page, the green shaded boxes, um, has some interesting information about it. Uh, one of the most interesting things, I think, is if you look at the very first white row across there where it says all wage earners, Average annual pay in 2006 for Missoula was 30680 If you keep going across that top line to the next major box under 2020, average annual pay there is 28927 and that's in 2020. What's going on here? Well, this is reflecting the fact that Missoula's overall economy is shifting from having high-end wage earners, having high paid jobs to being much more of a lower end service economy kind of a economy. So even though wages will probably go up in general for individual things over that time period, overall the mix is going to be declining. Um, again, these, are, these projections are not ours actually. These, these income projections are based on a national firm called NPA Data Sources that does these kind of projections professionally. So this is, is this somebody else's crystal ball, not mine. Um, for the income part. Um, you see here some, some various different kinds of uh, professions. These are all single household professions. 
The column that you can see there with the red in it is the gap between what they can afford and what the house would cost them if they were trying to buy a house as a one-person wage earner household. If you see how big that gap is and then think about combining a couple of wage earners, you'd see how much more money the second in uh, income earner would have to make to be able to fill that gap. And then the, the last column uh, on these charts for 2006 and 2020 is, again, the percent of income needed to rent a, a median-priced two-bedroom apartment. And looking at 30% as the standard, uh, some of the households in Missoula are, are looking at difficulties right now. Retail salesperson, even an elementary school teacher at just a one house, single household elementary school teacher is paying a little bit more than 30% for an apartment at this point, median priced apartment. Um, but of course, 2020, those things are all over 30. It, it's a big challenge to be able to afford rentals at that point. Over on the bottom, uh, blocks here with the bluish shading in it. This is an attempt to kind of, of think into the future, and I know we kind of got this idea actually from the planning office here in Missoula, who put the question out to you as a community about a year ago. We think we're going to need this many housing units at some point in the future. Where do you think they should go? Well, this is sort of a way of getting all the other counties in the state because we're going to do one of these for every county, to kind of think about that same question. Our data sources were probably a little different than the ones that you used in your projections, but they're kind of, they ended up kind of in the same place within five or 10 years or so. Um, this, this tells you, as of the 2000 census, the first column of data there shows you how many units were in poor or very poor condition in 2000, and we're just assuming that those units probably won't get rehabbed and they're not going to be in the housing stock going forward. So that's a way of sort of drawing people's attention to the fact that you've got some housing stock, it needs some help. If you don't help it, it's going to drop off the map and what's going to be left, you're going to be short that number of units. Second column over then is what units that are currently existing we can count on will still be there pretty much in 2020. The third column then is, is how many units do you think you're going to need by the year 2020? And we got that number with population projections, but we also factored in the changing mix of households. And if you, you look up above there, just a little bit above in that same blue area, but in the box that goes across, the um, change in population for Missoula from 2006 to 2020, again, this is according to this NPA data sources, will be about 20, just under 22 percent. But the change in the number of households you're going to need is closer to 25 percent. And in part, that's because of the aging of our population. We're going to have a lot more seniors, senior households going forward than we have before. In fact, by 2020, uh, we're projected that statewide 18 percent of the population will be seniors. They typically live in smaller units. They live, and uh, a lot of them are single. They live independently. So the number of units that we're going to be needing is more than just the change in population. Finally, the last column then shows a rough estimate of how many new structures you'll need to add to be able to accommodate the housing for the population that's going to be here. But we haven't had any, we haven't made any decisions about how you want to do that housing. We've left it with question marks because it is an, an issue of how many of those new units are going to be single family, how many are going to be multifamily, how many are going to be manufactured housing. And that's part of the discussion I know that you've already started and that you're continuing today and, and going forward in uh, what's happening in Missoula with your housing needs. So um, let me just stop there. And I won't go over the Montana statistics. They're based on the very same type of calculations, but this is statewide. So um, that's just for your own information for looking at the fact that, that there's now enough other areas in the state that are having difficulties that even statewide we're seeing the same kind of problems that you've been facing developing statewide as well as here in Missoula. So thank you. Nancy, thank you very much at uh, this time. I'd like to remind everybody that uh, we're going to have an open forum for questions at the end of the program. I'd like to continue on with our speakers at this time and would like to introduce Nick Kaufman. Uh, Nick is going to do a PowerPoint presentation for us. And uh, Nick's background, he received a, a bachelor's degree in economics and a master's degree in rural, town, and regional planning from the University of Montana. 
Currently, he is an instructor at the University Department of Geography. He has more than 26 years in planning and design of residential, commercial, and industrial development. His experience ranges from traditional neighborhoods and mixed-use developments to shopping and power centers, walking street commercial design and industrial parks, and even sports facilities. He is currently the vice president and a principal at W. GM Group Inc. located in Missoula and has worked there for over 24 years. He has also won the George Award from the Missoula Area Chamber of Commerce for Outstanding Community Service and the Hickson Fellow from the Kiwanis International for Community Service. Nick, thank you for coming. You bet, Zane. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure which of you get my best side, the panel or the folks behind, but I think, I think you guys win the award. So anyway. Um, I'd like to talk to you a little bit. Nancy talked to you uh, somewhat about the affordability side um, of housing, and so did Kim in terms of the ability to buy a home. I'd like to talk to you a little bit about what goes into a home and what those components are, what they cost, and how they add up together. Um, this is a presentation that's sponsored by the Missoula Building Industry Associ Association and the Missoula Organization of Realtors. And Colin Bangs, who's one of the panelists and myself, uh, worked hard with a lot of people to put this together and we do this every few years, so you get to see a progression of the items that go into the production of housing in Missoula. And we did this one in April of 2007. Now, I'm gonna let you look at numbers here for a minute because they put me to sleep, but Nancy talked to you a little bit about why affordable housing and workforce housing is good for the economy. And she put it in the context of uh, if people are going to work in a community, they need housing. But I'd like a show of hands for every person in this room who derives their income in some fashion from housing. Don't raise your hands yet. That means if you're in the Office of Planning and Grants and you review subdivisions or you're working for the city, county, doing, doing housing grants, whether you're a real estate person, work for an engineering firm, whether you're a carpenter or a developer. So if you derive part of your income from the housing production function, raise your hand for me. All right, so with that, shows you is that it's an important local economy because it supports a large number of jobs. So if you look at the Center for the Rocky Mountain West, Larry Swanson's data, um, the top job producer for Missoula County in 2006 was retail, followed by health care. And then if you add construction and real estate together, you find out that they're number three in terms of the total number of jobs in Missoula County in 2006. So the housing production function is important because it provides affordable housing, workforce housing, and we're one of the largest employment sectors in Missoula County, at least we were in 2006. Nancy talked to you about um, housing affordability. Uh, the first red circle in 2002 go down to a three-person household, and you see that in 2002, our data is a little different than Nancy's. They had 112% of the income necessary to purchase a median-priced home, but in 2006, they only had 84% of the income necessary to purchase a median priced home. And later in the last quarter of 2007, they only had 65% of the income necessary to purchase a single family home. So what's frightening is aside from the energy costs, right? we in Missoula County, our median income families cannot afford to own a single family detached home. And that happened this year, mark your calendars. So we're going to talk to you about a subdivision that we did with Colin Bangs uh, in 1996. It's called Inverness Place. These are photos of the affordable sort of modest homes over in the River Road area. And we're going to look at this subdivision over three time frames uh, to see what it would cost to do in each of those three different years. And so the goal is market rate housing close to services at affordable prices. The site is on River Road, just south of the Clark Fork River, which you can see in the upper right-hand corner of the picture, and just east of Reserve Street. Um, this is an air photo that shows the completed subdivision. It's certainly classified as an infill project with public sewer and water, uh, mountain line transportation, and uh, close to what used to be a neighborhood school called um, Emma Dickinson. But that neighborhood school, which is about four blocks away, is closed now. Um, we have a growth policy. And the growth policy shows that we're looking for about six uh, dwelling units per acre in this area in the primary urban growth area. Of course, the background zoning is not congruent with the growth policy, and any development in this area would require a change in zoning 
to achieve the densities proposed in the growth policy. This is the zoning. It shows that um, the property, some of the property has come into the city as RLD4, and we're doing it as an RLD4 with a PUD overlay back when the subdivision was done to achieve somewhere around five dwelling units per acre with all those services. This is an air photo of the completed project, um, Inverness Place. There is a park common area to the north. Um, this was done to address some of the concerns of the adjoining property owners and to create a buffer along that side. Existing home and shop buildings in this area, and this comprises the new housing stock and the new street, Inverness Place, with a short court adaptability here and here to keep infra infrastructure costs uh, in control. You notice that we have boulevard sidewalks on one side of the cul-de-sac and curbside on the other. That's a constraint of the actual lot width and it required a variance for that infrastructure modification. So initially, the subdivision review process, at least in our county, appears simple, consistent, and straightforward. That was before the legislature met two years ago. Fix things up for us. Um, so we're talking about development within the urban growth area. We're talking about a major subdivision and we're talking about what the legislature calls a 60-day working process. Those are the expectations. Well, when you get into the process, it's not quite as simple as it might seem. So there's an intake form process, there's a pre-application process, packet element review, packet sufficiency review, the submittal of the packet for planning board review, and then in the city, a plat annexation and zoning informational hearing, and then a city council hearing. PAZ recommendation and then a council vote. The last two steps can actually be consolidated in the hearing and often are. But there's additional time and costs and they include likely applying for a zoning change because much of our urban area, even though the growth policy calls for higher density, it's never been implemented with zoning change. So you might look at a growth policy that is four dwelling units per acre or six dwelling units per acre, but the zoning actually might be one per acre. So now you have to go through a zoning change process. Planning board hearing, governing body hearings. And um, there is some good news in this slide, and I'll talk about it when I finish. It, these are the time frames. So preparation for a pre-application materials request and time between your application and you can meet with staff used to be 30 to 90 days. It's closer to 30 days now and actually can go faster than that. The request for the pre-application meeting, the submittal for element review, the submittal for sufficiency review, and once you're through sufficiency and agency comment, that's when your 60 working days start. Now the good news is, is that in those top four rows, those time frames have become increasingly more compact and more efficient, and we really appreciate that from the Office of Planning and Grants here in Missoula County. Ravalli County is another story. So the neighborhood review process. Whenever you build something in someone else's backyard, there's always great interest because it brings change. But it also affects the affordability of housing. So what's required by the regulations for public involvement? A meeting with a neighborhood, and the developer has to provide a response to the neighborhood comments. If a zoning change is proposed, the neighbors have the right to formally protest the zoning change. So in Missoula County, a protest overrules a county commissioner decision. And in the city, it takes a two-thirds majority of those present and voting if there's a protest from the property owners within 150 feet of the property being proposed for the zoning change. So now comes the rub. You can have a growth policy that encourages what your developer wants to do, but in order to get that zoning, you're making a change in the expectations of the adjoining property owners, and there's the potential for a protest. So neighborhood participation usually actually results in improved design, but neighborhood participation may also add unnecessary costs and be contrary to the growth policy goals and objectives to accommodate community growth. And this is where the local governing body and their agents need to enter the conversation because it's not just the developer that has the, the, the legitimacy to support the growth policy and the infrastructure extension policies. That needs to come from the governing body. The developer, oftentimes, whether it's a profit or nonprofit, has their hands full just addressing the design issues and proposed change coming to a neighborhood. So what's the effect on housing affordability? We can lose density. 
We usually wind up upsizing the homes. We usually provide additional open space, which isn't the most efficient way to provide parks and playgrounds to our community. Someone has to pay for the maintenance of those somewhat inefficient small common areas. And the increased costs are forward shifted, of course, to the home buyer who pays for them over that 30-year mortgage and that 20% down payment that Kim talked to you about. So this cartoon kind of shows the, what communities face as they try to accommodate growth in affordable housing. There's Charlie Desha on his tractor out on Mullen Road. He can't afford to farm anymore. There's the developer. That's Colin. I have plans for your property. There's the planning consultant. In this place we'll use Elaine Hawk. Do I have to appear at another public hearing? There's black eyes and bruises all over. And then there's the recent resident with about five children in tow. Hey, no more growth. Our schools are overcrowded. Well, not really. We're closing our schools. There's the county planner, Roger. Uh, it will take at least two more years to update our master plan. And the little kid is saying, hey, where will I live? The historian preservationist, we must preserve farmlands, woodlands, wetlands, floodlands, steeplands, flatlands, historic lands, scenic lands, parklands, and all other lands. And then our elected public officials. We need economic development and affordable housing. How about a moratorium? That's a cartoon from 1990, 17 years ago. How much progress have we made? Let's look at uh, the change in the price of land. And so in 1992, the first set of rows, we're looking at land at about $8,200 an acre. In 1994, it more than doubled to $19,300 an acre. 1996, 42,000 in 2001, 56,500 an acre. So from 1992 to 2001, a seven-fold increase in the price of land. We looked at recent sales of developable land, 2003 land costs. We were looking at $65,000 an acre. And in 2006, we were looking at $100,000 an acre. So the price of land has skyrocketed in our community. And we'll talk about infrastructure. So we've talked about the political and, re and governing body review environment. We've talked about the price of land, and now we'll talk about the infrastructure, the sewer, water, storm sewer, boulevard landscaping, street, boulevard and curbside sidewalks and curbs and gutters, all of which are necessary um, for housing. So in 1996, you can go down the right-hand column and across the rows, and you can see in Inverness Place the cost for sewer, water, street, curbs, sidewalks, storm drainage, landscaping, engineering, and you see that the total cost per lot in 1996 was $14,600. That's your total infrastructure cost per lot 11 years ago. Then in 2001, that jumped to $18,000 per lot. And then in 2006, it jumped to $24,300 per lot for infrastructure, partly due to the world demand for oil, cement, and other items. Here's the comparison from 1996 to 2006 on the infrastructure side. So we've looked at land, infrastructure. So the price of residential lots sold. These are lots under one acre in the Missoula urban area. And you can see from 1990, you could get a lot for 14,000 in 2006. It was $95,000 to buy that same lot. Subdivision review process costs about $3,000 per lot and can take up to two years. And once again, um, our thanks to the Office of Planning and Grants for catching up and reducing that time frame. So the summary per lot costs, there's the neighborhood process, which is the smallest component, the subdivision review process, carrying costs, infrastructure costs, 
and land costs. And infrastructure for the private developer or the nonprofit organization, as well as for the city of Missoula, remains to be a continuing, unpredictable, increasing component of providing workforce housing and affordable housing to our community. 1996 construction costs on a 1,200 square foot crawl space home like the one shown in the picture was 56,544. So now I'm talking about the actual physical construction of the home. And there are the components that go into the construction of that home. Permits, sewer permits, utilities, architect, excavation, concrete, framing, roofing, siding, windows, doors, heating and plumbing, insulation, cabinets, cleaning insurance, and miscellaneous. Well, it's a 1996 cost to build that crawl space home. In 2001, it shot up to $70,212. 2006, 96,404 to build the same home. Here's your change in costs from 1996 to 2006. Here's your housing cost summary. Comparison between 1996 and 2006, and you can see the percent increases. You see that architecture gone, has gone up 215 percent. I'll show you architecture here. This is because we need architects more in 2006 than we needed them in 1996 because of the permitting processes. So the city of Missoula provides some perspective. Fee increases pay for increased costs and services, labor and materials, at the local governing body level, accommodating increased public interest in growth and development, compliance with federal and state mandates, protecting the Missoula Aquifer and the Clark Fork River, extending police and fire coverage, and providing parks and open space. And these are what happens with the review fees, whether they're zoning review fees or whether they're subdivision review fees or whether they're um, impact fees that come from the subdivision process or parkland dedications. This is a quote, I believe this is from Roger Millar, who's the director of the Office of Planning and Grants. And he says, it is abundantly clear that solutions to provide affordable housing lie in the areas of increased density, where appropriate to reduce per unit land costs, more attached housing, to make efficient use of expensive materials, use of new construction materials, techniques to further reduce costs, and streamline permitting to reduce carrying costs. We believe a cooperative effort to reach these solutions needs to be put forth. And Roger, we agree with you. Excuse me. That's the end of that particular presentation. Um, what I'd like to finish up with in terms of my closing comments are Something's going to work here, one way or the other. Um, the housing production function employs the third largest group of employees in Missoula County. We provide affordable housing and workforce housing. And for those of you who are nonprofit affordable housing providers, we help subsidize through donations and our time and talent contributions to that base. Okay? We pay property taxes, and property taxes are what support local government. And we pay the majority of fees associated with providing that housing, whether it's impact fees, review fees, increased park fees, building permit fees. Our industry is facing a challenge because of the economy at a national level and increased energy prices. As we continue to tax the housing production function through increased fees, we have a lower propensity to provide what all of us need most of all, which is jobs, affordable housing, and workforce housing. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Our final presenter for the day is Sheila Lund. Sheila has 25 years experience in finance and is the vice president and secondary market manager for Security Bank here in Missoula. 
Sheila has and continues to serve in various organizations and is currently serving on the Board of Commissioners for the Missoula Housing Authority. Thank you, Sheila. It was on. Good morning. I can't read without my glasses, so I'll put these on. Um, I'm sure everybody's been aware of what's gone on in the media and radio, television, talking to your local neighbors about troubles with uh, financing options and what's happened with the subprime situation across the nation. And I was just going to do an overview of some of the issues as a lender that affects the possibility of home ownership, not necessarily just in Missoula or the state of Montana, but across the nation. Um, I think as a preface for that, I would say that 99% of the lenders sell their loans into the secondary market, meaning that a local lender is not necessarily going to do a portfolio loan and hold it on their books. And that is the most favorable way for your borrowers to get the best interest rate and the best term for a long-term mortgage so that they can uh, purchase a home. So things changed rapidly in 2007 with a variety of historical events that we are still experiencing today. Uh, with all the economic changes nationally and somewhat statewide, we are all eventually affected in one way or another. This year has proven to be full of changes and lots of volatility. Uh, the opportunities that many potential home buyers had previously uh, experienced are likely gone at this point. Some of the stated income, stated assets, the combo or the piggyback loans, which were utilized with people that had little or no down payment or 100% financing or 100% plus your closing costs, those basically have gone away entirely. Uh, credit score requirements have tightened up where a conventional loan prior to the last year was a 620 credit score for an acceptable program on a conventional loan, which is typically harder to qualify. The bar has been raised on that from anywhere from 680 to 720. Um, and a lot of the loan to values have been lowered so that people are required to have a larger down payment. We haven't been put into the category yet of declining market areas, but there are areas that are around us in the Northwest. I just saw a bulletin yesterday where Bend, Oregon, uh, Seattle, Bellevue, Washington, all of those areas are now looking at being able to finance less on a mortgage because they have slid into that declining market area. Um, and borrowers now have to have a down payment, which in a lot of the programs previous, they could do 100% financing. One of the big impacts of all of what's happened with the subprime debacle is that Fannie Mae has increased the cost of financing three times since December of 2007. And they refer to these adjustments as loan level pricing adjustments, and they're based on borrowers' credit scores between 620 and 740 and loan-to-values greater than 60%. So if you're going to borrow 50% on a mortgage, they don't really care if you have a 620 credit score, but anything above 60%, there's going to be pricing adjustments that are going to affect the cost of somebody getting a loan. And I have uh, given you copies of what those loan level pricing adjustments are that went into effect June 1st. So you can look at the uh, graph and see the credit score and then look at the loan to value and the percentages are based on the loan amount. So as an example, if you were gonna look at a $100,000 loan and your credit score hit was a half a point, that's an additional $500 in closing costs to get the same interest rate that you could if your credit score was higher or you were borrowing less. Um, which really, you know, 
a lot of people can qualify based on their income and their debt ratio, but they really do have a limited amount of cash available for closing costs and down payment. So this has really uh, made it even worse for people who would have performed just fine with a credit score of 620. Now they're technically being penalized by having to pay the price of what Fannie Mae has implemented in these loan level pricing adjustments. Uh, FHA has just implemented risk-based pricing, which I gave you a chart for that also, which is on the top of this, which it was always before that the upfront mortgage insurance premium that got added to the loan was 1.5%. Now that's on a tiered basis, depending on, again, the credit score and the loan to value. And they have changed their monthly premium from a half a percent to a half to 0.55% for the people have, who have a lower credit score and are borrowing a maximum amount. I actually was reading something this morning and there are possible changes in the future, a moratorium on FHA risk-based pricing premiums and increasing the minimum down payment from three to three and a half percent. I called HUD this morning and that is a possibility. It's being um, sent out with different investors' emails for updates for lenders, but even the person that I talked to in Helena could not verify for me this morning whether or not that would actually take place or not. But the, if they do away with the risk-based pricing, I would assume that the interest rates would probably increase to cover that cost. And the... Uh, Mortgage insurance is for the lender in case the borrower defaults on the loan. It has nothing to do with life insurance or any benefit like that to the borrower. And then so the drawback to that, if they increase the down payment requirement, that hurts us on that side as well. Uh, let's see. Uh, HUD has recently terminated some of the seller-funded down payment assistance programs, which go into effect October 1st. One of the popular ones that people have been using in our area is called the Genesis program, where the seller would actually pay the cost of that and funnel it into a nonprofit agency that would then gift the money for the down payment. And I think HUD thought that that was a circumvention of the no seller paid down payment. A seller can pay closing costs for an FHA loan or a conventional loan, but they cannot assist with the down payment. So again, we have uh, limited resources for people uh, who need down payment assistance. We utilize the Home Start through the Federal Home Loan Bank in Seattle a lot, which is a matching grant program, which is awesome for people. Um, they are required to save $1,666. They get a matching grant of $5,000. If they sell the house in a year, $4,000 of that would be paid back. If they stay there for more than five years, they pay nothing back. So it's a great incentive for people. We use HRC, which is the Human Resource Council. Unfortunately, most secondary market lenders do not recognize either of those sources for acceptable down payments. So the only avenue that we really have to sell those loans to get the borrowers the best rates or to the Montana Board of Housing because they recognize that as an acceptable source for your down payment. Otherwise, people can't really do it. So if you have a borrower who makes too much money that doesn't qualify for Board of Housing, they probably wouldn't qualify for this either, but still we have limited resources of what we can do in the lending world with those types of situations. Um, private mortgage insurance is used for a conventional borrower who has less than a 20% down payment, which Kim was talking about the cost of that. That also has changed significantly uh, the minimum is a 620 credit score, but depending on the loan to value, if you were going to try to do a 97% conventional loan, then um, the cost of that private mortgage insurance has increased, and overall the cost of the private mortgage insurance has gone up 20% since 2007, so that's an another additional cost to the home buyer. 
Um, Congress did pass it, so the private mortgage insurance is tax deductible in 2007. They have extended that to 2010, but if your income is 100,000 or more, you do not qualify for the deduction. So again, you know, they give you a bone and then they kind of take it away, so it's not really you're not really able to use it for everybody across the board. And the other thing is, is if you were going to look at possibly doing an investment property because you could afford it and you wanted some rentals, you now are required to put down at least 20% because you cannot do private mortgage insurance if you're an investor. Another limitation that was just implemented for people who do um, invest in real estate, the maximum number of finance properties has been reduced from 10 to 4. So if you're financing something other than your primary residence, you have to have a limit of four units that are financed. You can own more, but you can only have loans on four. And of course, that's all done through the process of the credit report. You match up somebody's real estate owned with what's showing on their credit report. And I guess maybe one thing that wouldn't show would be a contract for deed because that's not reported on your credit report. But they're tightening up all of the guidelines with regards to secondary market and uh, investment properties. And then I guess on a more positive note, the economic stimulus uh, package, um, they have raised the FHA conforming loan limits. In Missoula now it's up to 291250 which is great. It was around 225 last year. And so really if you're looking at an upper priced home and you have somebody who has not much cash for a down payment, they can utilize this program rather than possibly looking at a conventional loan. Um, one of the things that has also increased is the maximum loan amount for uh, the jumbo loans is what we refer to. Unfortunately, the misconception that we've probably funneled more questions over is it went up to 620 or 729 in a lot of areas in the U.S., which is for high cost areas. Missoula County or nowhere in the state of Montana, the statistical metropolitan area qualifies for a high cost area. So our jumbo financing for more expensive homes has basically gone away. The interest rate since last November has been about eight and a half percent. So those people that are looking for, you know, a more expensive home are having more difficulty financing them. What we would do before is utilize a first mortgage at the 417, which was the conforming loan limit, and then do a piggyback or a combo loan to pick up the difference. There was a great program, a 30-year fixed on a second, which is unheard of, and the combo and the piggyback loans have totally gone away. We don't have that as an option either. Um, let's see. More recently, the Housing and Economic Recovery Act of 2008 was signed by President Bush. With this, there are eligibility and income limits. Effective dates are on or after April 9th of 2008 and before July 1st of 2009. The tax credit is 7,500 and there is a payback provision. The, tra the tax credit may not be available with all loan programs or financing options, which this is something I just read yesterday from an email from the Board of Housing. The people that do Board of Housing loans apparently do not qualify for this tax credit because of a difference of what is identified, I think, as a true first-time home buyer. I see. So the people that maybe could have, you know, gotten some benefit from it if they're doing a board of housing loan, they don't qualify for that tax credit. So just so everyone knows, you know, about that. Um, in some of the discussions that we've had recently through the Missoula ADAPT, um, we've been talking about mixed-use properties where you might have a business and a 
you know, a residence in the same building or whatever, and I have provided um, updated information for everyone about that. It's a great idea, but I think before people assume that it's going to work and people can get financing, they need to check with their local lenders because there are a lot of stipulations that would not allow for mixed-use financing, whether you were working with a commercial customer that wanted to do a business loan and have a residence in the same house or vice versa where you have, you know, primarily a residence and a daycare or something like that. So that um, I thought would be useful information. And then also, which I don't have it with mine, but I included um, some information about condominiums because that's kind of the new buzzword around Missoula and I would say that um, most lenders in Missoula are really not that educated about condominiums we're in the process of getting there but because of all of the changes again that have occurred with that I know that Nancy and I have had various conversations going back to last summer about insurance and other issues with condominiums and basically what Fannie Mae has done is put all of the responsibility onto the lenders to review the entire package for the approval to make sure that all of everything that has to do with the the detached attached the budget the reserves absolutely everything that would comply the reps and warrants now the lender is uh, actually responsible to do all of that and I know that Colin has had some experience with condominiums and it really isn't that easy for most people to get financing unless there are certain requirements that are met with the occupancy, the loan to values, whether it's attached or detached. It gets very, very complicated and so, you know, before we assume that we have lots of avenues for condominium financing. I think we still need to do some work to get where we need to be to help benefit the public with that type of financing. Thank you. Thank you, Sheila. We're hearing a lot about uh, obstacles in the availability of affordable housing and the future of affordable housing. I'd like to introduce the balance of the panel members now, or self-introduce the balance of the panel members. We'll start on my left with Andrea Davis. Andrea, if you could give us just a bit of your background. Certainly, Zane, I'd be happy to. Um, my name's Andrea Davis. I am the Director of Planning and Development for the Missoula Housing Authority. I'm a Montana native. I'm from Western Montana, Kalispell, Montana, um, in fact. I uh, started my affordable housing career with Homeward. In fact, I was an asset manager. And so understand the, the property management and the uh, compliance implications with affordable housing. And then have been with the Housing Authority for the last five years. Thank you, Nick. Um, um, privileged to work in the development capacity and um, it's you know speaking to the choir to basically say the challenges that we have to do development particularly for affordable housing um, costs aren't any different in terms of land costs um, infrastructure costs we have um, rent restrictions that limit our ability to finance those projects now we are able to tap into some grant resources but often those grant resources um, are far and few between we have our peer agencies that are uh, utilizing the same um, pool of funds. And um, so um, just to wrap up, what I'd like to say is that coordination and collaboration is, is absolutely necessary as we move forward. The Housing Authority largely focuses on the rental population. And uh, we do have a small home ownership program through our Section 8, which um, actually we have a home ownership celebration coming up in partnership with First Security Bank and Homeward and Human Resource Council. A number of organizations came together to get one person housed, which is indicative of what it takes, the amount of resources to get one low to moderate income person housed in a home ownership unit. But without affordable rentals, we will be in a situation where folks won't have the capacity to save the down payment and establish themselves to become homeowners. So I know our conversation largely today is about single family home ownership and uh, multifamily home ownership, but I would like to just leave you on a note to say that we must keep in mind affordable rentals when participating in this discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Colin Banks. 
Um, looking around the room, I see almost nobody that needs an introduction to me, so I'll make it short. I'm a farm boy from Inverness, Montana. Been selling real estate for 36 years. Been doing developing entry-level housing for the last 15 or, or more. Thank you, Colin. Elaine Hawk. Elaine Hawk, I'm a land use planner with Territorial Landworks. I'm a graduate from the University of Montana and a native from Stevensville, Montana. I started my career with land use planning with the Office of Planning and Grants and was with them for about five years and now in the private sector. Thank you. Ryan Morton. Ryan Morton. I'm with the Missoula Building Industry Association. I'm from Missoula. I have a degree from the University of Montana in Economics and Communication Studies. And just as a point of introducing, what we're looking at is looking at what we can have some sort of control over in terms of providing housing in Missoula. One of the things we're looking at as well is infrastructure, especially at the state level on sewer and water. And uh, anyone that wants to join that fight, <laughs> please uh, feel free to contact me because it's one of our top priorities. Thanks. And Ruth Link. Hi, I'm uh, Ruth Link, the Missoula Organization of Realtors. I'm their public affairs director. And uh, I am also a native Missoulian. I went to the University of Montana with a marketing degree. And uh, we're just looking at solutions um, to get M Missoula housed. Thank you very much. Again, I appreciate everyone's participation. And I would like to ask if we have any questions from the audience. We have a great panel, a number of uh, very uh, educated and qualified people. If anybody has a question for the panel, certainly now is the time. Uh, raise your hand. We'll provide you with a microphone. We've got some issues on how to provide affordable housing in this community, and uh, hopefully somebody has a solution to how we're going to do that. I would like to ask the panel a, a question then in that regard. Are there examples in Missoula of any voluntary projects that have led to affordable housing, and how are these projects doing today? Anybody familiar with any? By voluntary, I'm talking about many communities have, by government regulation, imposed certain criteria through zoning or subdivision regulation on mandating certain types and amounts of affordable housing. I'm talking about a voluntary program. Anybody familiar with any that may exist in Missoula area? None? Okay. Any questions from the audience? Anybody have a question? Yes. Hi, my name is Betsy Hans. I'm the director of Homeward, and I just wanted to um, ask the panel and maybe Nancy, who is most familiar with home buyer education and its role in first time home buyers purchasing their first home, if you could just elaborate on how you think that will help with um, this discussion. Sure. Um, the Board of Housing has, for many years now, required uh, some, a certain portion of their home buyers to take home buyer education. And what we have found over the years is that our uh, delinquency and default rates are lower because we've had folks taking that class up front. I think that uh, we're moving in the direction of requiring it from a larger percentage of our home buyers as time goes on. In fact, our, our brand new 2008 loan program we just launched, today's Tuesday, yesterday, I have to keep track of which day is which, with uh, our first bond issue of the year because, of course, the subprime market has really done a lot of damage to our capacity to be able to borrow money cheaply enough to be able to turn around and support uh, less expensive loan rates for folks as well. But our new guidelines under Fannie Mae for our new um, MBS program require all loans in the MBS program to have home buyer education. Um, I think it's even more critical now that we have seen what kind of trouble people can get themselves into if they don't understand the intricacies of financing and that some of those loan products may not be the best fit for uh, what you're trying to do. Of course, a lot of those loan products, as you pointed out, Sheila, aren't around anymore. But I think that it, it always, I guess the way to look at it is to say that for most folks, buying a home is the largest financial uh, investment that they're going to make in their entire lifetimes. And what we'd like to be able to see with our homebuyer education classes is that they have a chance to learn fully about what that involves before they do it so that they have that information going forward. 
Um, we have home buyer education classes here in Missoula that we sponsor, taught through Homeward, and they're, uh, I believe, free, are they? $10 for materials, right, which, of course, the materials that you get are, are just the paper alone is worth much more than the $10 you pay for them, I'm sure. But I know they're backed up with a lot of comprehensive education as well, including participation from a lot of people from the building industry itself who come in and talk about different aspects of the home buying process. So I would certainly encourage anyone who's interested in buying a home. There are some potentials out there now, although it's harder, but the best way to start is to find out the full nine yards of what you need to know by taking a class first. Any other questions from the audience? Ms. Evenson. Thank you, yes. Actually, um, I, I was curious to know, you know, at being a Montanan, we're always last to get hard at we're always last to get hit with the economic downfall, and we're actually always hit the hardest, and it seems to always last the longest because of our lack of major industry here. And I guess my question is more for, for Nancy than maybe even Sheila, but as we've been watching the current markets and the financial declines in our industry and in others, how is the state planning to prepare for you know these foreclosure issues that we're hearing about, and heart and uh, the housing reversal issues. And is there also a local plan to deal with all of that? We have some uh, statistics. In fact, I have a couple of maps with me that are tiny that I can show you afterwards that indicate where subprime lending took place in Montana and where we're most likely to see our higher rates of foreclosures coming into play. In general, Montanans did not do as much subprime lending as other states in the country have done. So even at its worst, the problem isn't going to be as bad here as you're seeing in other states. Um, I think maybe it's because we have people still understand that there is no free lunch maybe in Montana and they didn't quite fall into those things quite as much as, as other people did perhaps. I don't know, but it, it's heartening to see that we didn't do that. Um, the board has, for the last two years, been sponsoring uh, extra resources going into foreclosure prevention counseling. I know Homeward, again, is one of the providers of that counseling here in the Missoula area. And we also have a, a training program to get more counselors on board around the state. There are some areas of Montana where our subprime problems are concentrated. They tend to be in the larger urban areas. Uh, Kalispell area, Missoula area, Great Falls, and Billings tend to be where they're concentrated. We see some concentrations in Butte a little bit, and then a couple on the Indian reservations tend to be where we see those problems developing. And we have some outreach efforts to try to get some counseling to those areas underway. Um, in terms of financial assistance to those folks, our board, under the new law that was just passed at the end of July, does have the ability to be able to use part of our new authority to do refinancings. The difficulty with that is that they have to be refinancings that fit within certain parameters of creditworthiness, et cetera. And so they're really refinancing for borrowers who probably didn't need to have one of those loans in the first place. We can perhaps help that type of borrower. There are other programs out there that can help that kind of borrower. For the folks who just merely, simply just went beyond their means and just can't afford to keep going, there really isn't anything that any of us can do. Thank you. Any others? I would like to pose a question to the panel and any panel member or all panel members who would like to respond, please feel free to do so. And that question is, if we are facing, uh, facing difficulty in providing affordable housing in Missoula, what is your recommendation? What are your priorities? What are your proposed solutions to increase and make more available affordable housing in this community? Mr. Bangs. I'm going to take it on two steps. One is what I'd like to see happen at the legislature that would help us here. Um, the, the two priorities, I, the three priorities in the legislature I see, one of which doesn't affect Missoula as much as other places. One is we have a huge problem in trying to get water rights to do public water systems. So if you don't hook to a municipal water system, you're stuck with, with wells and septic tanks and no other way of doing business. And that's not in the long run going to be affordable, especially considering we want more concentrated housing. That's one problem. It affects the rest of the state more than Missoula, but it still affects Missoula too. There are subdivisions already approved out of the Y 
who have, that have not been able to get water rights may never get water rights under the present law. The second one is, the, like, like Ryan mentioned, the infrastructure. One of the reasons I was so excited seeing this map from, and the presentation from Nancy was that we are finally able to go to the rest of the state and say, look, this is not just Missoula's problem and Bozeman's problem and Helena's problem. This is a statewide problem that needs a statewide solution. And infrastructure help is one of the biggest things that they could do. How we're going to be able to do that, how we're going to be able to fund that is an open question. I have some ideas, but I'm not a politician. I don't have a, a way of, of implementing those ideas. But I think if enough people get behind this idea at the legislature, we can get a lot of different legislators from all areas of the state and both parties to agree that this is a, a problem that we have to find a solution for. So I would like to really encourage we, we have a large push along those lines. Going to the local level, we have to somehow find more places to build houses that don't include real expensive land and don't include, uh, you know, rebuilding old areas or, or infill and infill and so forth helps somewhat, but it's, it's going to have to have, have ways of getting the infrastructure to the areas that there is land available to build houses. We, we're going to have to do that. There's no question about it. We're going to have to at some point stop the steady increase in costs that the government puts on us for building houses, whether it be impact fees or user fees or uh, more park fees or whatever it is, we have to stop that also. We're going to have to get a control over our costs here or we don't have a chance. Suggestion or a comment? I do. Elaine? I think part of what I'm going to say we've already started to do I think that as a community, we need to reassess. We've looked at the projections for the future, so I think we're starting to look at our priorities for our community and reassess our goals and where we want to be. Um, but as we do that, I think it's really important to look at the implications of some of the new regulations and um, maybe lacking, and I'm not saying that they are, but that we should look at what tools could be implemented um, that could help us get to those goals. and really make sure that the implications of new policy and regulation isn't kind of diverting us from reach, reaching that end. Maybe one suggestion for um, kind of following up on what Colin is saying is really utilize the existing infrastructure that we have to lower the cost that comes with housing. And I think the UFTA plan has pointed that infill is really important, is going to be a key role in developing housing for our community and maybe we should look at things like accessory dwelling units and how we can make those a viable option. Ruth? Um, in, in our program there is um, an example of a partnership that was incredibly successful in Silicon Valley and I think that's a really great place for us to start, take advantage of each other's strengths. Um, even locally, we've already kind of started that with the Missoula Housing Report. It's a collaboration with Homeward, the Bureau of Business and Economic Research, MOR, uh, Sheila Lund, and we have a snapshot of what our housing market looks like every year, and that's a really positive thing, and I think we need to move forward with that and expand on that. Anyone else? Andrew? Um, just to coattail uh, off of what Ruth said, you know, in looking at a state like California where there um, are many more resources at the state level than a place like Montana, we have the opportunity for some legislative opportunities, and one of those being the Montana Housing Trust. Uh, we have a legislator in the room, Betsy Hands, and um, Nancy Leifer has also done much work on um, the Housing Trust Fund opportunities that can benefit both affordable rental and home ownership. Um, we need to start creating more resources at the local and state level because the federal government is forever going to be pulling back, or at least it appears to be pulling back its resources. And we certainly feel that at the Missoula Housing Authority where much of our housing subsidy that affects the folks that Nancy was mentioning earlier, those that pay 30% of their income towards rent and are subsidized, we are receiving less and less of those funds on an annual basis. So how do we make that up? How do we continue to provide resources for those most in need in the community? and um, 
local control, I think, is what's going to be necessary, which is something that Colin mentioned as well. So the housing trust fund and, um, you know, I don't want to use the T word in terms of, of taxation or any of that type of thing, but taking a look at our structure, obviously, is I'm speaking, I know, to the choir on this, but that's something we're going to have to examine on, the, on a state and local level as well. Thank you. Nick? I think at the state level, the identification of the housing production function, not just the need for workforce housing, but the number of jobs created by that production function are critical. And it's the best kept secret at the state and local level. The second thing is that infrastructure needs at local levels aren't just for the people who own homes here. Nancy talked about the cut bank example, which could result in $40 million just to stay status quo for upgrading their sewer and water systems. There also needs to be capacity for that new growth close to services. And the crisis we're having and the largest increases we're seeing in the housing production function are with infrastructure. So unless the state of Montana can come up with a way or a method to help finance the replacement of infrastructure as well as the expansion of infrastructure, we're not going to achieve our goals for the person in the middle. The person at the bottom is taken care of. The person at the top is taken care of. It's the person in the middle who's being disenfranchised from the housing equation in the state of Montana. Thank you. Ryan? Kind of beating a dead horse. I keep this, the water rights thing is such a big issue in water in general. And just so you know, the the water policy interim committee has drafted legislation for a revolving fund to pay for for municipalities to pay for water uh, systems and possibly replace them. I don't know all the specifics yet, but that might be one area to really have everyone look into. And then I'd just like to also toot our horn in terms of building practices that the Missoula Green Build Initiative is a really good way to approach building standards that the market's providing here in Missoula, or at least trying to provide, and we're educating builders on how to build green. That's, I think, a really promising um, avenue that won't solve the problem, but is, it could, could definitely add to uh, the long-term affordability of housing in Missoula. Thank you. We have run out of our time, and I want to thank again our presenters and our panel members, and for all of you who have attended in the audience, thank you very much. Appreciate your, your turnout and your interest. I think this has been a worthwhile discussion, and I appreciate ADAPTS putting this on. And I have one more comment from Nancy. Um, I was just realizing I'm always behind the curve on technology. You don't need to give me an email address if you would like to get a copy of the white paper. All you need to do is go to our web page, <laughs> which is very simple. It's uh, www.housing.mt.gov. So it's housing.mt for Montana, .gov for government. There's a website there. We have a place to go to publications and whatnot, and when we finish it, you can access it from there. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thanks again. Thank you.